Pero bueno, eh, vamos también. So, during the session, that will take an hour and a half before starting this class. We're going to listen to some music that will be played by the technical team.
esta canción, bueno, yo soy Marlene, voy a moderar. Hello, my name is Marlene, I'll be the moderator of today's class. I'm from the Pacific. And I know this song because of the group. And this song is one of the things that was known about the Caribbean coast here in the Pacific today. More is discussed, and I think that this class will be an opportunity to get to know more about that beautiful and interesting region that we should do more to connect ourselves. And so, as I said, this class will be an hour and a half long. We're going to have space where Victor will be speaking about this region. After that, we'll have time for questions and answers. And so the idea will be that we'll be here together until 2.30. Yes. Oh, is Ari, is Ari translating? Can folks hear me? Uh, and so I'm going to now let Fausto do a presentation. And that is going to be more general than the presentation of Victor del Cid. So it's... Good evening, everyone. Good afternoon. Friends. Today we'll be in this class, which has a very important topic, which is the Caribbean coast, both the north and the south. So presenting Victor Dossier, perhaps Victor, for all his life, has dedicated his life to education and formation as an anthropologist. He is from Guatemala, but he lives in Nicaragua. Victor Del Cid has worked for many years on the Caribbean coast and has helped us to better understand this huge region, this immense region. The Caribbean North and the South, and then part of the Rio San Juan the San Juan River. And so Victor works with us in the Iala Ishim Uleo. He is a professor at the UNAM, the National University of Nicaragua, and he has collaborated us uh, with, he has collaborated with universities in the Caribbean coast as a researcher. And on top of all, he is a comrade. And that's the most important thing for us because past uh, just, or more than just the academy, he's also uh, a comrade who has collaborated with us through the good and the bad. And he has provided support for formation and our work. And so, uh, you know, I'll finish my presentation and I'll let Victor Del Cid um, present. Um, So thank you, uh, and that is my presentation of Victor Dalsted. So thank you. This isn't, you know, a class or a conference. What I propose that we do is just kind of some round of dialogues and a way that you all can ask questions. I would say that this is more of a converse, introduction, conversation. Um, and I know that a group of you are coming here and there's not a better way of understanding a people than by being there um, in the day to day in the reality. I don't know, Erica, can I continue? Yes. Forward. <laughs> um, uh, he was just wondering regarding translation, but hopefully you all can hear me. <laughs> so uh, Nicaragua is in the center of the heart of Central America. It's characterized by its multiculturalness. It's the point where two large migrations met. I'm speaking uh, of the pre-colonial time the, the, of the people who were here originally, the indigenous people. There was a migration of the central basin, what is now Mexico from the north 
um, and from that region of, Mes of Mesoamerica, which is like the southeast of Mexico, slightly north of Costa Rica, uh, kind of close to part of Guatemala, part of El Salvador, and part of Honduras, this region in the Pacific and the north and center of Nicaragua. And so this, and part of this region as well in Costa Rica, which is what we call Mesoamerica. We have a lot of things in common, like marimba, corn. Some uh, ceremonial practices. The uh, rock that's used to like, uh, like smash corn, there's a name for that. But, uh, there's the people of the Mayan people from Guatemala, the Nahua from El Salvador and other uh, indigenous groups from Honduras, the Strategas, and, and other people that make up the multiculturalness of this region, and Costa Rica, which has eight indigenous peoples. And in Nicaragua, culturally, on the side of, on the region Mesoamerica, there are four larger indigenous communities, the Chorotegas, Nahuas, Matagalpas, and Misiu, or Misiu, which live in the Pacific region. Um, they're about a 10% of the Nicaraguan population. And then there's another migration, which there was in Nicaragua, which came from the south. It, was, it came from the uh, Colombian Amazon. They're Amazonian peoples. And these people, these people are known in literature as the people of Macrochiches, um, which these, uh, there's many different groups of these people and they arrived to Nicaragua. And what was so bef before called this language that was known as the Mesquitu language, and this ancestral region of the Mesquito, Mesquitu had a, a migration that today it are called the Mesquitu and Mayagna people and the Ulua people and the Rama people. Those are the indigenous peoples of the Caribbean coast of Nicaragua. And so Nicaragua has two coasts. It has uh, in the Pacific and the Caribbean and so all these people together form the multiculturalness of Nicaragua. When we talk about multiculturalness, we talk about the coexistence of different, cult different cultures. You know, sometimes we don't, they don't understand each other uh, fully or there isn't respect, right? Or they just don't know each other, about each other. And so this multiculturalness of Nicaragua was never really known in an official level. And that also is the case in most of Central, in the rest of Central America. What was normative of in our region were the, con were the constitutions that were just copies of the Spanish constitutions from Spain from 18, um, when there was a liberal revolution in the 1800s. Uh, they're open some space to kind of change some of those, the norms in the constitution, but all the constitutional history of Nicaragua was characterized in a way that did not mention the indigenous people or multiculturalness or that there's these people's rights. And so I tried to kind of create a homogeneous culture, essentially one culture that said we're all mestizo people, mixed race people. And that was the idea of creating a Unitarian culture, but it was falsely Unitarian because I tried to incorporate everyone that was different into one hegemonic or homogeneous rather culture. And so that was in a lot of Central America. And so the indigenous people were known as like almost like a backsliding of development. And so like they were almost like seen as like a problem that we had to 
you know, pass. We had, we had to over, over, we had to defeat almost kind of pass this problem, which was known as the indigenous people. So we have to incorporate them into Mestizaje. And so it was kind of using this like Catholic uh, official language and Catholic, uh, you know, identity. Uh, and so reunifying or homogeneizing all these people under kind of Mestizo identity. And so these all across this region, there were policies for indigenous people that were not made for them, right? And so all of this changed. All this changed in um, uh, 1886. One of, sorry, sorry, 1986. One of the uh, one of the main things that was known from the Sandinista Revolution, which came up when it was triumphed in 1979, was the uh, problem of you know uh, ending discrimination to, and being able to incorporate all these different cultures from their own differences above all the, pe the people and the cultures of the Caribbean coast. In 1980, a big thing happened in the Caribbean coast. A big step was taken and there was the big alphabetization, alphabetization program during the Somoza dictatorship only 53, 52.3% of the population could read. And that was, um, uh, you know, and in, in, so actually 52.3% people couldn't read. And in the Caribbean coast, indigenous communities, it was like 80% people couldn't read. And so when the alphabet, when the teaching people how to read occurred, that was one of the biggest steps taken after the, um, res re like the, resurrection, the, not resurrection, the rise of people, the revolution happened. This was known as like the second re uh, revolution, which was the cultural revolution, which was to reduce alphabetization, like the people who couldn't read to 12.2% of people. And for after a while, Nicaragua was known as a country that defeated um, illiteracy and that was recognized by UNESCO. And so, but, but in the indigenous cultures, people didn't want to learn how to read in Spanish because that was, was, you know, would give more power to the colonial language and to colonialism. And so they proposed that the literacy programs in the Caribbean coasts would be in their proper language, in their own languages. And so in that same year, 1980, they did the literacy program in the languages Mayagna, Mistitu and in Creole. And it's not uh, English Creole, it's not standard English Creole. It's a language that rose in the Caribbean. And when you're there and you'll hear people speak in Creole uh, or English, you'll be able to, you know, you'll be able to understand them, but they ha it has their particularities. And so, this was a law that was uh, uh, promoted uh, by link, like bilingual education, but also teaching people in their proper languages. And in 1986, after many consultations, there was a new con constitution in the country. And so two, 200 years of colonialism and 300, Sorry, I said 300 years of colonial legacy and 200 years of conservative governments, liberal and conservative governments, which were the uh, governments of the 19th century and part of the 20th century. This uh, ended, that history ended with a new constitution, which with a new constitution that was like known as almost like the refounding of Nicaragua and that's new constitution changed Nicaragua for everyone of their beliefs. The constitution of 1986 was implemented in 1987. Why is that important? Because this is a constitution that is a vanguard in Latin America to recognize the existence of indigenous people. 
and Afro-descendant. It has changed the Nicaragua state, recognized the country has a multicultural country, multilingual. It recognized that are original uh, people and Afro-descendants, and they have their own rights. So they have their rights first to recognize their existence, to recognize their identity, and they also have the right to res to 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 preserve their organizations, their our authority, your forms of administration, the, ad, the uh, justice administration, their own ancestral health system. They have a, they become a subjects of rights. And in Nicaragua, it also looks different. It's the country of everybody. Is to make a multicultural society but also to have a citizen, a multicultural citizenship, respect to the difference. And it's going beyond uh, similarities or having a single identity. We have to recognize that they are uh, different. There was a very important step uh, if you want to have time, you can review the constitution. There are two, articular, two articles, the five and the eight. And it's the key to understand this big change because those articles recognize also to the uh, ownership of, of, of land, of the property of the land. Respect to uh, private uh, ownership, uh, cooperatives, cultural uh, ownership and also the cultural ownership. And that's very important uh, for uh, the, the original uh, nations, the ancestral ownership of the land and the self-determination have their own uh, development model and have uh, the, uh, their own identity in the coast, before it was called Atlantic Coast, it was a, a process of, of consultation where everybody was uh, asked and all the different territories and uh, intellectuals, economists. It's almost two years of the process of consultations that end in forums, national forums, that they uh, created the autonomous regions in 1987. Uh, 27 law or law of autonomous of the coast Caribbean of Nicaragua. That's the autonomous law. In 1990, through uh, election, through vote, general vote, the first authorities were elected, regional elected. Re there's two regions, the Caribbean Coast North, that has the capital in Bilbin, or Puerto Cabezas, where the majority of the people are uh, Miskitos and Mayagna. and a lower proportion is Creole. And the autonomy is uh, south in Brewfields. And there the multiculturalists, uh, mainly Afro-descendants, Creole, and Garifonas. There are some mosquitoes, Hewels, and Ramas. And they, uh, they interact in those territories. In those two regions, they have a, a regional uh, consejo. Or it's a organ that uh, do the legislation, have uh, consejeros that uh, represent each different culture. 
in the regional consejos. There is a equality of uh, representation of the different organizations plus two federal deputies or representatives that, that uh, they have a governor coordinator at the different the different uh, departments, education, health. And that's how each region work. Out and they organize autonomies. There is 25 territories in each in this region. Uh, territories, a uh, group of communities that they have historic being, being uh, link, uh, cultural similarities. Every 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 one of these regions have their own uh, ownership of the land, and it it's a total eighty five thousand. It's a uh, uh, almost a third of the country of uh, Nicaragua. In each uh, region, they have their uh, authorities. There is the traditional authorities that are elected by their customs, community leaders, their their representation, their spiritual spiritual leaders, uh, traditional healers, uh, community leaders that are the people who administrate the, the land and the justice and that the territorial uh, governments who are the ones who look at the community uh, organization and these receive from the from the uh, federal government uh, budget to do their uh, work. I don't know if uh, onto this point you have uh, specific questions. Oh, I don't know if Eric, Erica has a, a, a map that uh, she can share with us. Let, let me see if I find one. But let me, let me see if, if there's questions. Uh, let's see how, how people feel about oh, what I have shared. Um, hi, my name is Troy. This is really interesting. And I guess I just wanted to ask uh, a little bit more about how decisions are made within the territories. Los territorios son territories. Uh, let, let, me, let me see if, if, if we can have the map. Uh, well, uh, the, like I say, there are uh, community uh, organizations, the Mayagna, for instance, that more ancestral groups, they get uh, groups uh, like uh, Jana territories and the eight territories. And the nine territories, they add like 8,000 um, um, kilometers. And they, it is changing the, according to the titles of the land. In general, all these 25 territories, they, they add a, a large proportion of, 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 the, of the country. We are, we are small, they are a smallest country. They are important to, to mention that the ownership of the land is the most important part of the indigenous people. Uh, in Central America, it has created a lot of conflict. It's very uh, linked to to colonization uh, and, and development of uh, agricultural system that are based in monoculture. And it's not just a, a, a matter of uh, colonialism, but it's also uh, when there were uh, other governments that were having uh, development uh, directed in one way. And with these laws to recognize community ownership has been a long process, but there is a law that uh, recognizes uh, this ownership of communal ownership, communal ownership. And that uh, recognize the 
customs and, and traditions of each uh, organization that uh, they own uh, each each organization or each they recognize. So, so uh, let me see if I can have a, a closer look at the region. Yeah, you can see them now uh, more clearly. So if you see all these different parts of the Caribbean coast, there is the Caribbean coast and, and, and Nicaragua, uh, who with Honduras have the, have the larger extension in the Caribbean coast. Uh, there's uh, like 800, 800 kilometers of uh, coast in the Caribbean. It's line that you uh, was called the Mosquitian Coast because that's the name that they, the English give to this region in the, in the 18th and uh, 16th century. This uh, area was a part of the fight between the British and the Spaniards in, the, in that region. All this was part of, of those uh, challenges between these two powers in the in the in the Caribbean coast. The part that is very uh, close is uh, the 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 English influence. And in the other region, uh, there is a more influence of the Spaniard uh, colony. In the in the region of the uh, Caribbean coast, there is more protest, protest, protestantism, and in the other region, Catholicism. In the Caribbean north, the Mosquitia is the uh, more is the larger community. The Miskiria, uh, uh, the indigenous of Mosquitia, they have a double citizenship. They are Hondurians and Nicaraguans. It's a strong uh, culture and they have a very close relationship between uh, the two different countries. How do they organize? Like I say, each each region, each uh, community have their own authorities, and they tend to have uh, the older who have a, a consul, and they provide the, the advice to the government. There is so there uh, level of organization that they are regulating the, the ownership of the land. And there's the uh, organization at the territorial level. And, and they are selected by uh, their uh, different costume. It can be by uh, kinship or it can be by religious. There are some that are in the in in the in the rivers, so they are uh, they are located in the coast. The director uh, are also um, in a process of, of of elections to. Uh, do the, the, the administration government of the territories. And these are divided by eight territories and it at more than 8,000 uh, kilometers. And the North part is where they have the uh, Miskirio influence and the South that has a different colors is the autonomous region in the south, where it's more uh, an Afro-descendant Afro, Afro uh, 
inhabitants, the Creole, that they arrived in the 18th century. Uh, sometimes they were uh, former slaves that they escaped. Uh, they were working on, 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 on logging. The Garifunas have 250 years in the region. And they were coming from the Venezuelan coast from conflict in the French and uh, British colonizers in the region. And a more recent migration that coming from 100 years ago. And they preserve a lot of the dances, the drummers, and the expressions of the African uh, descent. And there is the Rama Creole. The, the Rama are similar to, to the Mesquitos, they are Chichas, and they uh, share the territory with the Creole. That's what it calls Rama Creole, because there's also a Creole descendants in the region. And that's how the territories are divided. There is one question and a comment. Let me uh, read the other question. What kind of uh, cooperation economically and politically are between the indigenous people and the Afro descendants in the Caribbean coast and the uh, the whole Costa Rica territory has 51,000 uh, kilometers. What kind of cooperation there is in between the indigenous uh, population and the Afro Afro descendant population? The, the indigenous territories, there is a uh, very complex, and there is different five different levels of governments: the community, the territorial, the municipal, the regional, and the national government. So. So there is a uh, different different levels of networks, uh, community networks, and, and the places of encounter is in the regional uh, council. The concejales uh, they represent their own uh, in a etnia. So the mosquitoes have their own. Um, way for communication and encounters, uh, traditional encounters every year. They have a binational encounter and they have their own uh, system, their economic system. That is this, this different from the Pacific. And the Pacific is uh, it's very leaning to um, to cattle raising, raising, and then the in the Caribbean they have a more traditional way of, uh, of 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 development and more oriented to self sufficient. There is a small agriculture, silviculturism, fishing. In those systems of their own production, their own uh, economic development, they have their own identity and they are like looking for their own uh, self-government. There's development in terms of roads and they might have a positive influence in the consolidation of the, of the uh, autonomous territories to have a, 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 a different kind of development. But the development is more based on the identity of each uh, region, like improving their 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 the systematization of their languages. And that uh, one of the reasons why these two different uh, universities in these territories. 
And this is different from other countries because they, in other uh, countries, they have a national university that assimilates the different cultures. But in this case, the autonomy provide their own uh, universities that operate on their own languages and their own culture. And when we see at, at this model of uh, different kind of development, we have the autonomous also on their education and in their own way, how they organize their health system. Uh, like I say, in 1990, it's when they were elected for the first time. And in 1994, they have two universities we have a university in the South region and the North region. Those universities have their own careers that are that are focused on the on the on the needs of of each community. So engineering on small agriculture, sociologists to help in the autonomous organization, um, science of the ocean for fishing. Um, lawyers that are uh, are focused on on autonomies of the of the regions, uh, doctors that know different languages and also understand uh, traditional healing, teachers they are specialized in different languages. So they are universities that are, are tailored to their their own communities. And they have uh, a good amount of uh, educators. And they has a strong impact. There's no more need for, you know, experts or who are representatives, you know, of a hegemonic mestizo place. Uh, now we have a more multicultural society. And so this has been one of the most important gains, successes of these two universities, which are now part of the national university system in Nicaragua, and they receive uh, the same amount of budget as the national universities in Nicaragua, in, in Managua rather, which is 6% of the national budget. And other gains have been in the health sector, you know, the indigenous people have had some of, some of the worst uh, and so, so there have been gains there, not just because not just because there are you know, more hospitals, more health centers, more roads to hospitals, but also where because like for example in the maternity homes, there's the traditional practices uh, where people will be attended to uh, in with their culture, and so. There also has been recognition of traditional medicine support uh, with universe, uh, bringing universal health care to the country. And one of the challenges still is to strengthen the productive systems that are not necessarily oriented to the market. And so they don't generate an act, like a like a access of uh, recourse resources that can be invested into the families. Right now, production is kind of just for the basic uh, indigenous communities. Above all, are subordinated by a stronger economic system. And so there's a, a search, you know, yeah. 
eh, la, la autonomía se da en el marco de un Estado Nacional. ¿no? Entonces, no es... So, to, to, to clarify this question in the chat, uh, autonomy is uh, in relation to the national state, right? It's not sovereignty, it's not uh, autonomy with their own resources and stuff. And so in the case of the national military and the police, it's not like autonomous, right? But what what we can say is that a majority of the police in these regions are native. So they are of the same people. And so there's better comprehension. Uh, same with soldiers. Uh, in the, the small posts that there are there, they are also native. And let's talk about, you know, the justice system, something very important. There is a recognition of the plurality of the justice system. What does that mean? It means that the state of Nicaragua recognizes that there are two justice systems. There's the uh, system, like the you know, Western system, which is to punish when a crime is committed uh, according to the norms right established in the civil code or the penal code. But there's also recognition that indigenous communities, when a member of that community, of that indigenous or afro descendant community commits a, a, a you know, crime, that would have like, let's say like a five-year punishment in the civil code. Well, it, in this communities, it's, it's, they follow their own justice system. They have their own justice system, which is not oriented towards punishment, but instead uh, oriented towards like the communal living system, communal harmony. And so that's what we call pluralism of, judi of a judicial system. So each community has a community judge, it's called a wichta in, in, Mestiz, in the Mestizo culture, and they administrate justice in, in you know, collaboration, I guess you could say, with you know, faith leaders or ancestral leaders, and they have their own internal systems of, to reestablish uh, co-living. Like, so that's uh, kind of, I believe the term you use is like restorative justice, but I don't. I don't know if that's a direct translation. Um, but so in these communities, they can determine if they're going to do, they're going to resolve their issues with, you know, the civil penal system or their, their own community systems, because oftentimes issues are resolved better by with the community, between the families that have been involved, they'll get together and they try to get restitution within the community so that, and in a way that the community can continue forward in harmony and see these are some of the big advances. And this is also incorporated in the penal system of Nicaragua in the codes. There's an art, article called the Article 20 of the uh, penal system, penal codes, uh, the, uh, authorities. Uh, indigenous authorities in the judicial system. You know, and, obvious, obvious, and often it's not necessarily to have police in every community. Sometimes we'll go to communities and there's no police. And that's because those communities uh, deal with their system, their issues within their own, just, uh, own methods. Are there any other questions? It doesn't seem like there's any more questions in the chat. I don't know if anyone else has any other thoughts. Uh, you know, if you have any opinions, that's okay too. Or any more questions? Victor, I have a question. The phenomenon, or the, the law 28, which is the law of autonomy, you know, I've been in Ecuador, Peru, Guatemala with the Garifuna of people of Honduras. Are there other laws of autonomy in those countries 
or is our autonomous law in Nicaragua the only uh, one of its kind, um, which was created by the Sandinista Revolution in 1986? There are many different experiences of autonomous, uh, you know, advances in Latin America. For example, in the case of Guatemala with the peace accords, the peace agreement, there is a point which has to do with identity and culture, which is the where there have been advances, but in, in topic of like land, very little. And so still the indigenous people of Guatemala continue their struggle for autonomy, which is not recognized uh, yet officially. You know, there are recognition of culture and language, but autonomy is much more than that because it covers you know, everything. So this is also the you know proposed idea of the Zapatistas is like auto governance. And that's part of the Zapatista proposal. In Honduras, there is a law of autonomy which has not been discussed by the Congress for more than 20 years. And so there hasn't been a lot of hasn't had much life in Congress. Yes, there has been recognition of collective property in some communities in the in the Mesquite region of Honduras. There has been some, you know, local government formation, uh, but there has not been a formal declaration of the state that's been very explicit. There's, you know, just kind of a tangential article in the Constitution. And so the demands of the indigenous people in Honduras is after 20 years that there be a discussion of the law of autonomy so that there can be a development of autonomy for the indigenous people in Honduras. And in El Salvador, uh, as their case is different, a bit ago, as a few years ago, the ex ex existence of El Salvador, indigenous people was recognized. And still, they have not incorporated indigenous people in this national census. And so there are fewer uh, indigenous people in El Salvador, and their struggle is to, for basic, uh, is basically for recognition. And in Costa Rica, has a series of indigenous territories where there is recognition of uh, collective property. Uh, but the uh, central government has a institution that kind of deals with these lands that isn't part of the indigenous governments. And so there still is a struggle over in uh, Costa Rica over these indigenous lands. And there's a proposal of a, an autonomy law, which the state of Costa Rica has not shown much interest in um, discussing or passing. So there's kind of a system of like reserves, reservations rather. And there's a kind of central government that still reg uh, regulate the indigenous land while the indigenous people, which, it, but the people continue to do something which is called like recuperation of land. And in Panama, there's a very old, system of autonomy in which is a product of a Guna revolution, which is, so I think there's a region in Panama which has some autonomy, but they uh, deal with some of the same problems of lack of recognition, um, lack of recognition of their collective land. <laughs> and, and there's other uh, experiences in Rio Negro, uh, Rio Negro, in Colombia, and in other countries like Ecuador, Bolivia. The 
despite the struggle of the Mapuche people in Argentina and uh, Chile for autonomy. And so autonomy has with its particularities. So there's, there's not buen vivir, which means like good living um, without autonomy. Um, and so buen vivir is, is part about, and autonomy is about being able to dictate your own uh, means of development. And that's, that's part of all of what the idea of autonomy is about. And in all these cases, Nicaragua has been, has been one of the uh, examples and most advanced models. It's one of the first constitutions which uh, recognized plural, plural nationality and since then has continued to be modified. You know, now we talk about like plural national states, but the, the constitution of Nicaragua was one of the pioneers. And in regard, in regard to autonomy, there hasn't been an ex uh, experiment as uh, developed and as this one with all of its difficulties. And, and, and so the uh, intercultural uh, struggles, all these, all these different struggles have been fortalized uh, by the struggle in Nicaragua, you know, now in Colombia and in Bolivia and Guatemala, which the, there are intercultural universities. The one in Guatemala is not official. There's also some in Mexico, but, a, you know, a, a big reference for those universities um, has been the universities in Nicaragua, which came with the law of autonomy, which rose with the law of autonomy. And so, each country has its unique advances. Different states have reacted differently. But in the case of Nicaragua, it is a case to study. And you can do comparative analyses with other cases, not just in a declarative way. You know, we have a law for languages, you know, a law for uh, indigenous or yeah, indigenous medication, but it's not just about laws. Um, it's also about changing the institutions, right? And that having institutions that promote inclusive uh, laws. And it's not just about the declarations, but it's also about what we see in the reality, right? What's actually happening? How are things being uh, concretized? How are things being turned into reality? We have another Andres from San Jose. Thank you. Good, after all, good evening, <laughs> afternoon. I am speaking here from Punta Arenas in Costa Rica. I'm very uh, happy to be here. I send a fraternal uh, greeting from Costa Rica here in Costa Rica. I want to, you know, defend the gains of Nicaragua, where a lot of news things only talk about the negative things about uh, Nicaragua, you know, criticize the president and the vice president, and you don't hear about anything else about what's happening in Nicaragua. And it's about uh, misidentifying Nicaragua um, and attacking Nicaragua. So I am constantly looking for formation, education and videos, and I share them in, you know, chats uh, or forums that are, you know, well looked at in this country. I no longer debate with words, I, I debate with videos. And this helps me kind of deepen my arguments. And I would be very grateful if you could send me this video. I put in the chat that uh, Costa Rica has 51 square kilometers, 51,000 square kilometers. And so the indigenous communities have a great percentage of Costa Rica, like 
and Costa Rica is now multinational, well, sorry, sorry, multilingual and multiplural. Um, but it's just to kind of meet certain uh, standards. We have many different ethnicities, like Victor said, and we have about 24 uh, indigenous territories that are no longer called reservation because that concept of reservation uh, implied kind of a closing in. And so that's what you have in the United States. In Costa Rica, we now call it indigenous territories and they're regulated by uh, the white people, uh, by national institutions. And so in reality, what we're doing and uh, the transnational corporations and capitalists, powerful capitalists, have also been buying land, uh, even though it's not pro it's even though it's prohibited by law, it's not allowed to buy. You're not allowed to buy uh, indigenous lands, or ancestral lands, but they do it. They have destroyed a lot of these territories. And right now, the indigenous people are fighting against these, you know, white institutions. Uh, for example, there's an institution which is called the Community of Development Institution. It's like a government entity, um, which and in estos años. Uh, and we also have, uh, there has been some kill indigenous people that have taken, uh, that they have been uh, take over uh, by the, the people that is trying to get more land. And they have been the fight that try to get more or more of their own land. But if we compare Nicaragua with Costa Rica, we are like a hundred years. Uh, in disadvantage. Uh, unfortunately, I, I don't really have a, a connection with indigenous people in Costa Rica, but I know that they are trying to uh, protect their traditions and fight the consumerism. And unfortunately, it feels like we are actually uh, walking backwards in, in, in our in our nation compared to Nicaragua. Oh, what uh, we hear, uh, what the people say of Nicaragua, outside Nicaragua, it's uh, something very common that uh, it sounds like we are in a, in a fight, that they are in, in, a, in conflict and all the media are trying to show this Nicaragua and these ideas that, that are, are not, not, not real. But I'm not going to focus on that. In, in Nicaragua, we don't use uh, the, 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 the word abor aborigine. We don't use it because we, uh, we see it as a colonialism. Can I, can I, can I keep going? So, so in Nicaragua, we don't use the, the term aborigine, Indian, natural, and others because we uh, see these language, these, these uh, terms as uh, racist uh, with a colonialism background. They have a different meaning. Uh, that, that, they, that are not reflecting the indigenous people. The meaning of those languages are, are not uh, reflecting of, of their own people. Naturals is like making the, the people that is more uh, behind. When the OMT uh, pronounced on the 50s, uh, they were talking about indigenous populations. It was uh, 30 years of fight of, of the countries to, of the indigenous people to 
have uh, fighting to, to get a set of population have uh, people. The, the people have rights and they were uh, able to change that uh, concept. In 1989, it was, uh, it was able to, to change the OMT, it was able to change the population from people. It's an uh, important advances of recognition. More recently, the people, indigenous, they propose the concept of original people. That it uh, that goes deeper because it recognizes that the the that people were here before uh, the arrival of the Spanish or original people. Uh, in the case of Mexico, for example, there have been on important advances on, uh, on, on recognizing this concept of uh, original people. Nicaragua, they are assuming this, and they assume it officially. The constitution was reformed, and the indigenous people was changed by original It's a, it's a just one a word change, but it has a lot of meaning. These, con these people that have been uh, discriminated again, uh, even in the academic, it's, it's important to have to adopt the concept that they are going that uh, then, what happened in Nicaragua is also more that the use of territory. In Honduras, they are starting to talk about uh, indigenous territories. And they are uh, getting a lot of the ex the experience that Nicaragua has had in, in, in Honduras, and they come and they uh, observe, they learn from what Nicaragua is doing in the territory. The territory is not a piece of land. The territory from the indigenous thinking is the ancestral land. The origin, the place where there is the language, the identity, where you live, the culture, the motherland is not an uh, empty content, it's, it's real. So the territory is a, is a building of this identity. That's uh, one of the advances. Uh, that the, the indigenous people have. have had. Now we start to talk about the indigenous territory, we talk about the origin, identity, the culture, the, 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 to recuperate the languages of indigenous people and recognize the territories. We have, a, we have to. to questions in the, in the chat. I'm going to read the questions in the chat and then we pass the microphone. So what's the challenge of the, of, of the, of the identity? And the second question, and what's the uh, famous uh, ship of the Broomfield Space? La mía es una pregunta también. Ah, no, let's see, Erika. Erika, it's, uh, it's, I also have a, a question, but I don't know if we have time. Victor, when Fausto and I, we went to Bluefields, we hear a lot about the, about the work uh, related to the language. We hear that there is different languages of the original people 
importante a flote de personas que todavía eh, van different hablan, amount of people that eh, still talk and they use la de rescate revitalization enforcement empowerment there's a different context looking at different context I don't know if you can comment a little bit about the situation of each language or Afro descendant languages how it's that process I don't know if process of identity and how the different governments are supporting this effort are they rescuing uh, the uh, empower the, the challenges of autonomy you you might see it at the end from the but uh, if you see it in terms of preserve the territory to control the, the the government and the preservation of the territory the, the process of, of maintaining this environment and have this uh, relationship and it's, it's something that is it's impossible to measure in terms of uh, economic development uh, or in general capitalism uh, measurements it's something that uh, we need to we don't have a way to measure this it's a more uh, a way of living, a way of uh, living and dying. This is something that we can build from the community. It's something that we can study and more closely. Not the same to li to to say the good living, uh, like Ecuador or Bolivia, uh, uh, and the good living in Mexico. But I think that this is something we can uh, study and also like uh, empower the, the, the development of these uh, populations. For instance, uh, the development of agroecology and support these developments, the, these uh, ways of production. And it's a challenge, the challenge of the languages. Like Eiko was saying, now we are in the second year of the center of the of the decade of the indigenous people. There are uh, some languages that they have become extinct, and so the ones that are at risk. And there's something that has happened for migration and, and other factors that have uh, make the languages. Uh, uh, close to disappear when we talk about the revitalization of the languages it's something that has been becoming uh, more a uh, current term uh, in countries like bolivia or mexico where there's a lot of diversity linguistic diversity and it's a, a way to 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 there's a strategy to avoid that the language is becoming extinct like in the case of Nicaragua and in the, the Miami uh, people, they have been created the Academy of Miami language where the linguistics, linguistic, uh, the work that they were for the universities, they have been working on having text and recollect these memories. The Mayagma, they also create their uh, radio where they have music, programs on Miami, and that's a way to promote their language. There is a, a network of community radios that they uh, speak at Miskito. Uh, there is a TV also in Brooksville where they promote their own languages. So that way is not substitute by the hegemonic language. This is among many strategies that uh, they have been taking to revitalization of the languages. In the Garifuna languages, in Honduras, for instance, they speak uh, Garifuna, and in Nicaragua they also speak Garifuna. And, and you will 
when they're dealing with learn the about the equality problem, and they come to the communities, they have to learn or they may need to, to be able to communicate with, with, with us. So uh, Creo becomes a common language, but they left their original language. Now, to revitalize their identity, they have to revitalize the language. How they are doing? Making associations of cooperation between the different uh, communities. And it's so that way that they have like 60 uh, children that they went to uh, uh, Honduras community to learn the language that revitalized the language. Uh, and it's not just revitalizing the language, but it's also revitalizing the culture, the identity, the cosmology. There is uh, another va variant of the Mayag, and they also have their own strategy who are focused on the household and improve the knowledge of the language in their house. And that's a way to revitalize uh, the nest of language. For instance, there is a person that that, that master the language and go with the children and create this nest of language. In the case of Nicaragua, one uh, language that is almost extinct is the language Rama. It went to extinguish because in the uh, 18th century, uh, 19th century, when the Protestants came to Nicaragua, they uh, assumed two languages, the Creole and the Miskito, uh, to evangelize the uh, areas. They use these languages and the, the Rama language was not uh, a priority. And that's why it also became a, a, a recognized by the, the Nicaragua state. The Creole and the other languages, they uh, are more, more thicker. The language is also a vulnerable language. And the language Rama that is pretty much uh, close to extinction. Uh, there is efforts to systematize their language. So that's the different strategies. And the Orinoco now there is already a pedagogy to uh, teach. Uh, they are uh, one of, of the strategies, like a use, use art, dance, music, with the drums, with the dances, is uh, one way in which they revitalize the language. And that also helps with identities. And it has a lot of uh, sense, because in the, the definition of the original uh, people, there's a lot of initiatives that is uh, being done uh, around the continent to work and to prevent those loose of indigenous or the original languages. And it's more common in the radio. There is uh, also a efforts of the university to provide this education in the languages and have professionals that know these languages well. And this got linked to the plurinationalism. There is no plurinationalism, but there is no respect to the different languages. And you can go to Brunsville uh, as an adventure, like I used to do it. You go to Rama City. There's uh, three rivers in there. Rio Escondido. It's three rivers that come from the Mekong. 
And those three rivers, they get together in one zone, that is the Tondidor River, and you can uh, navigate to Bloodfield Bay, and that's an uh, entry bay. And that used to be the classic way to get there. And it takes, a, it takes a little while. There's some people that I still do it. The alternative. So all the production of Nicaragua needs to either live through Honduras or Costa Rica. Nicaragua needs a port in the Caribbean. And there's also a great road that goes through many uh, forests in the humid tropics. And the rest of the, I guess, roadways, you could say, in the Caribbean coast are through the water, through rivers, lagoons. But yes, there are both possibilities, fortunately. the An airplane is the not only option anymore because it's quite expensive and anti-democratic. Uh, and so there's a good service of transportation between the Caribbean coast, primarily the Caribbean coast south. <laughs> I hope I'm promoting the adventure spirit. <laughs> well, we have, uh, you know, that's until 2.35, so I don't know if there's any other in the next eight minutes, any other questions? If not, we can. We could close. There's not any other comments, questions. I will uh, head out, uh, but I thank you for this audience. And uh, I'm excited to, I hope that you can come here. Uh, someone, you know, learns through, on the road. And so uh, our comrade here, Edgardo Garcia, will close for us. I would like to say that, the, the uh, you know, the people have always re strengthened ourselves through the territories and land and the there are the, these great resources for living, which are water, production of food, forests. And in some moments, the right has, you know, taken space, right? For like in 1990, the right comes and, and takes the government. And in those 15 years of the right wing, I remember that the workers of the state ate government, the, the workers of the state and the great food production in uh, cane, sugar cane, rice, banana, tobacco, and coffee, and uh, animals. All those workers that were in those state, uh, state uh, companies that were once in the hands of the Somoza government, the right would say that these that these state uh, farms would go back to their old owners. And we would say, you know, oh, that's okay. I guess we're going backwards. But in that case, if we're going backwards, we're going to return this land to the indigenous people because those are the first people, the, you know, the original owners. And so with that, you know, that base during the nineties, we've been, we were able to negotiate that a part of those territories would go in the hands of the worker, would go to the hands of the workers. And another portion of that territory would go to those who were retired from the military and those who were uh, demilitarized as part of the Contra. And so, so these uh, you know, land returns are part of being able to live in peace and in harmony. And I wanted to speak on this because since 
so the part of this convention that uh, there was a convention of this of Article 79, which uh, provided solutions of healthcare, education, and production of auto consumption and producing uh, healthy foods, but also uh, was a convention about living in peace. And these are issues that appear in all of Abia Yala, right? All these things that you're hearing in other about other countries, for example, uh, India or the occupation of other powers like uh, the UK, occupations of the UK. And behind all this, we have the struggle for land and we have solution, strategic solutions uh, behind all of these problems. So I just wanted to kind of propose that and discuss that. So thank you, Edgardo, thank you, Victor. Thank you to all the people uh, who took the time to be here with all of us today uh, before your anticipated travel to the Caribbean coast. Uh, thank you. Thanks, everyone. Ciao, gracias.